let's continue the story of orbital angular momentum that we began at the very end of lecture 1a. Now remember, just like the so-called principal quantum number, which, which talks about the quantized levels of energy that an electron can possess moving around the nucleus, the second of our quantum numbers, designated by a script L, describes the angular momentum that electrons can possess as they move around the nucleus. Now, classically, this angular momentum is the mass of the particle times the speed of the particle times the radius or distance of the particle from its center of curvature. So the further, the important thing there is the further out in R you get, the more of this angular momentum a, an electron could possibly possess. So what we found, as we talked about at the very end of the time uh, on lecture 1a, is that this angular momentum is in some way a function of n, because n is a function of the distance r of an electron out from the nucleus. You can't have high angular momentum motion of the electron around the nucleus unless the electron is sufficiently far from the nucleus. So n must grow rather largely before you have substantial quantization of the angular momentum around the nucleus. Now, just like the energy is quantized in integer amounts or steps, it's not continuous amounts of energy. Likewise, the angular momentum is quantized in integer amounts or steps. You can't have continuous amounts of the angular momentum either. Now, what the, we should think of, though, is that these electrons in motion around the nucleus are not in the classical sense at all that we would think of for a satellite in motion around the nucleus like the Rutherford model suggests they should be. It turns out that quantum mechanics more correctly describes the motion of electrons around the nucleus in wave patterns rather than motion around the nucleus as a particle moving around the nucleus. And consequently, acting as a wave, we have to rethink the, the way we even envision an electron around the nucleus. The best way I can describe what you should think of is that you take this mass of the electron, smash it with some quantum hammer, and the quantum hammer breaks the electron up into uh, an, an infinite number of tiny fragments. Then these tiny fragments disperse around the nucleus. Now, you should think of these fragments as kind of like the steam in your shower, after you get a very hot shower. There you go, you're in the shower, there are regions of dense, foggy steam in certain locations. There are regions of thinner, more transparent uh, fog in other regions of the shower um, uh, that you're standing in. So as I smash and disperse this electron around the nucleus, the tiny fragments of it, the infinite fragments of it, disperse in regions where there's high density, and so there's a lot of fragments present. There are regions where there is low density, or not very many, if none at all, fragments of the electron in these other particular regions. So then what you should do is paint a picture of the smash of these fragments of the electron and spread that over the nucleus, and you will have how, uh, a picture of how the electron distributes itself around the nucleus. Now, the problem with trying to envision what I just spoke of is that we have no tangible everyday connection in the real world in which we live in with anything else that behaves quite in that fashion. So it's a little difficult to picture what is going on here. 
So it's, it's kind of hard for me to give you a simple way to describe exactly what is going on in quantum mechanics. The best story is that the electron is not localized into a single mass. It is smashed into an infinite number of fragments, and then the, the fragments spread around the nucleus in regions of high probability or, or likelihood of occurrence and low probability, where there's very little likelihood of occurrence of the electron. Collectively, if you look at this spread of the distribution of a single electron over the nucleus, we call that an electronic orbital. And the word orbital pays homage to the Rutherford idea of the orbit of a satellite if it was a localized particle, but now it includes the idea of a delocalized, smashed and spread electron over the regime or the region surrounding the nucleus itself. Okay, so again, as I mentioned a little earlier, uh, the quantum number L, which dictates the uh, discrete or fixed amounts of angular momentum that electrons can take, can only get to large values as n gets to large values because n governs distance out from the nucleus. And it turns out that we really don't, as we talked about on previous slides, n never really gets very big either. It gets up to 7. Well, n gets up to 7 only because the nucleus becomes unstable as you add protons to balance the negative charge of electrons that you're adding around the nucleus. So it's really a deficiency of the stability of the nucleus that keeps n and l from continuing to grow towards infinity as you put more and more electrons further out from the nucleus. And it turns out that because of these limitations on n, only four values of angular momentum end up to be allowed on the stable nuclei, and even the unstable nuclei that exist in nature. The, the four lowest angular momentum orbitals can be populated, and that goes along with the seven lowest uh, energy levels for n that can be populated. So only four values of L, it turns out, are allowed. Those are L equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. And as we mentioned at the very end of Lecture 1A, on the last slide of the discussion, that chemists have, instead of using the number designation of the angular momentum of these orbitals, they have taken to using a letter designation for the angular momentum of these orbitals. And we will almost invariably exclusively use the letter designation as opposed to the number designation. And those letter designations are for the L equals zero or absence of angular momentum orbital, that is called an S orbital. When the electron possesses one unit of angular momentum in the quantized sense, then its pattern of motion smashed over the nucleus is what we call the P orbital. So it's riding a pattern that looks like a P. If the electron possesses two units of angular momentum, it's riding a pattern or it's distributed over the nucleus in a pattern we know as the d orbital. If it has three units of angular momentum, its distribution pattern over the nucleus is known as the f orbital. And I talked again about that at the very end. Those come, the designations SPDF come from the appearance in emission spectra of various lines that occurred in those spectra. Sharp lines, primary lines, diffuse lines, and fundamental lines came from electrons undergoing transitions to, to these orbitals, S, P, D, and F. So those are really the only ones we're going to talk about coming going forward, but I do want you to know and understand the rules for the orbital designations of all of angular momentum for the other orbitals. In fact, what I'm getting at is if you have L equal to 4, that is a G orbital. L equal to 5 is an H orbital. L equal to 6 is an I orbital. L equal to 7 is the L orbital. It's 
not the J orbital for reasons in physics is skipped. Okay, so pretty much so for our atoms, all we need to concern ourselves with are the four, first four values of angular momentum, and those correspond to orbitals designated S, P, D, or F. So what we've seen is that the allowed L values designating the quantized angular momentum depend on the energy level N that you happen to be populating for the electrons on the atom. Remember the rule as stated there is that L, script L, the angular or orbital quantum number is equal to zero, meaning there'd be zero units of this orbital angular momentum, then goes up to one, two, three, four, and so forth, but has, is capped by the principal quantum number to have a maximum value of n minus one. So what this means is, of course, again, n being telling you how far away from the nucleus you get, and this angular momentum, a function of how far out you can get the allowed amounts of its integer quantization depends on how far out you are from the nucleus is what this is saying. So as L increases, of course, the number of orbitals allowed on a level increases. And then as N increases, you're allowing more orbitals per level. And as a matter of fact, one more additional orbital of higher angular momentum appears on each energy level. So the bottom table shows us what happens beginning with the principal quantum number. It can, kind of controls the others. N starts at one, goes to two, goes to three, goes to four, saying there's discrete amounts of energy allowed in the atom. It can't take continuous values. When N is equal to one, L begins at zero and goes to N minus one. And that means L begins at zero and stops at zero. So there's only a zero angular momentum orbital allowed on energy level one. And that is designated as the one S. The one represents the, the energy level N. The S represents the zero angular momentum quantum number letter designation for that orbital. Once level one is populated, electrons start going into level two. And when n is equal to 2, the allowed values of angular momentum that electrons can take again begin at 0 and then are capped at 2 minus 1 or are capped at 1. So on energy level 2, there are now two allowed kinds of orbitals. And to differentiate them being on this energy level, we put the principal quantum number in front of them. So on energy level 2, you're allowed to have a 2s orbital and a 2p orbital. Then we go to energy level three, and L is allowed to start again at zero and caps at N minus one. So L starts at zero, moves to one, goes to two, and then stops. And that means on energy level three, there's a 3s, a 3p, and now a 3d orbital in addition to the first two. Then I, the final row shows that when you get to energy level four, you now have four allowed values of L that are allowed to happen. You can have a zero angular momentum one, a one unit, two unit, or three unit angular momentum orbital. And to differentiate them from any of the others, we put the energy level on front. And so these four orbitals would be designated as the 4s, 4p, 4d, and 4f. Now you should um, understand how to apply these rules and understand on each level what orbitals would be available. So for instance, on energy level five, you should be able to have a 5s, a 5p, a 5d, a 5f, and now a so-called 5g orbital, because that would be the, less, the next letter designation for the L equal four orbital that could begin to appear on level five. On level six, you can now have six different orbitals. You can still have the spdf, you could have a G and you could have an H. And they would be the 6S, the 6P, the 6D, the 
6F, 6G and the 6H orbitals allowed on that energy level. The previous slides talked about a new quantum number L and showed that the appearance of L according to the solutions of quantum mechanics was a dependent function on the principal quantum number N. So in a way N controlled L. And again this is what results from the solutions of these um, nasty looking quantum mechanical equations that we're highlighting here. Well, we still have a few more quantum numbers to go, and the next one I'm going to introduce is known as the magnetic quantum number. Now the reason it's turned out to be called the magnetic quantum number is that it took a magnetic field being placed on an atom to reveal the energetics that made it possible to determine and verify that the prediction of quantum mechanics that electrons possess this type of behavior. Uh, we, we needed magnets to reveal this sort of behavior, so this became known as the magnetic quantum number. The symbol of the magnetic quantum number is M subscript script L. So M sub L is what we will call this quantum number. And as we saw earlier, how script L itself, the angular momentum quantum number was a function of n. Here what the solutions to quantum mechanics show is that this new quantum number m sub l as may be anticipated because of the subscript it is controlled by the orbital angular momentum quantum number script l. So this m sub l is a function of l and it's what is learned is that once again this is an integer value saying that it can't be continuous just like other things that we've seen so far with the principal quantum number and the orbital angular momentum quantum number but now for the first time this particular designation is allowed to take both positive and negative numbers. So the, again if you solve the equations of quantum mechanics turns out to get analytical solutions that are, have closed form possibility for the existence of the electron. You need certain magical integers to fit the form that we will call are designated by m sub l. And m sub l like l begins at zero but now takes plus and minus integer values and can move up to plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, so it's quantized in that regard, but just like we saw L was capped, we now see M sub L is capped. And it turns out that the top value, and actually turns out to be the lowest value, of M sub L is equal to plus L or minus L. So M sub L ranges essentially from plus L down through zero down to minus L. So what this means, as we show below, when L is equal to zero, there, there's only one allowed value of M sub L, which is plus or minus zero, which technically there is no such thing as negative zero. So when L is zero, M sub L is zero. But when there is allowed to be one unit of angular momentum, there are not allowed to be three values of this M sub L quantum number. So when L is equal to 1, as we show there, M sub L starts at the lowest value of negative 1, goes up to 0, then goes up to a maximum of plus 1. So if you like, you could write it that way, or you could say 0, comma, plus or minus 1. When L is 2, M sub L starts again at negative L and it runs its way up to positive L integer-wise. So when L is equal to 2, the allowed values that can solve the quantum mechanical equations that show where electrons can exist on atoms begin at m sub l equal to minus 2, go up integer wise to minus 1, 0, plus 1, and then stop at plus 2, ranging again from plus or minus 
the L value which generates them. And finally, for the F orbital, uh, which is an L equal 3 orbital, it turns out that the M sub L's that are allowed that solve the quantum mechanical equation can range from minus 3 integer wise upward to a value of plus 3. So what it means then is that for every s orbital that appears, there's only a single s orbital because there's only one allowed m sub l value th that fits for angular momentum of zero. When l is equal to one, however, since there are three allowed values of this m sub l, then there are three allowed values of orbitals on that particular level and so forth. The consequences of this angular momentum magnetic quantum number m sub l is that the orbital angular momentum values of l are what we call degenerate. And what it means to be degenerate is that there's a repetition of those allowed values of exactly the same amount. And so the number of allowed m sub l's per l tells you the so-called degeneracy of that l value orbital. So since, again, l begins at 0 and goes up in integer value to n minus 1, and m sub l, again, if you like, starts at 0 and goes up to plus or minus l, for given l values, the number of m sub l's that appear tell you how many times that orbital repeats on each energy level. So when you have an s orbital, which is only possible when l equals 0, m sub l is only 0 as well. So there's only a single s orbital on each energy level. There's a 1s, a 2s, a 3s, a 4s, but they appear one at a, t at a time on each level. Now, when you go, however, to l equal 1, which begins on energy level 2, because L can only be 1 when n minus 1 begins at 2. So on energy level 2, the first appearance of p occurs. And the p orbital has uh, this L equal 1 value, but now has a degeneracy of m sub L being minus 1, 0, or plus 1. That means there are three p orbitals at a time. Then when you get to the third energy level, where you have three allowed different types of orbital, on energy level 3, you can have L equals 0, 1, or 2. On energy level 3, you can have a 3s, 3p, or a 3d. The 3s only has m sub L equals 0, so the 3s is non-degenerate, or comes one at a time. The 3p has three m sub L values, negative 1, 0, and plus 1. There are three... 3p orbitals at a time. The 3d has m sub l starting at minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2. That means there are five 3d orbitals simultaneously, all equal in energy. So for every orbital of a different allowed n value, you have allowed l values. For those allowed l values, you have allowed m sub l values. And this will ultimately tell you how many of each orbital is allowed to appear and on which level these orbitals are allowed to appear. So again, make sure you're clear with the rules of quantization and make sure you understand what it means in terms of the letter designations and how many of those letter designation orbitals are allowed to appear simultaneously on each level. Let's now look at what quantum mechanics predicts the shape of these orbitals to appear like. Now remember, no one has actually seen them. Now we have a lot of experimental evidence that these predicted shapes are true based on a wide variety of tricks that chemists have pulled off. But again, the idea is this. 
we would, should take an electron and smash it and then let the smashed fragments of the electron distribute around the nucleus. That is more in line with the so-called wave behavior that quantum me mechanics predicts for the action of an electron around the nucleus. Now this orbital is kind of like the, as I tried to indicate before, the foggy steam mist of this smashed out electron spread over the nucleus and if it happens to be an S electron, its orbital appearance smashed over the nucleus is spherical. Now this was not just made up by us, it was predicted from the solution of an S electron in quantum mechanics. You get an equation and scientists can just graph that equation and when they graph the equation of the appearance of an S electron, it looks spherical. So these yellow balls are representing this smashed electron for the hydrogen atom. The nucleus is somewhere buried deep in the middle of that electron cloud surrounding the nucleus. Now, this is the zero angular momentum orbital. L equals zeros, corresponds to S. And of course, again, there's an S on each energy level. So since the energy level one is in closest to the nucleus, you can think of the one S as being in tightest to the nucleus. Then for an electron riding energy level two, zero angular momentum orbital would be in a two S orbital. That would be sort of an onion layer out from the one S. And then if you're an electron in the uh, energy level three S type orbital, you would again be an onion layer out from the 2s. So we will just put shells, as they call them, of electrons on each energy level, each energy level getting subsequently further and further out from the nucleus, but each of these orbitals appearing to have much the same look as the orbital on the energy level below it. Let's turn to the quantum mechanical solution for the L equal one orbital shape. Once again, no one has really ever seen this, but if you take the answers from quantum mechanics, which have been solved for hydrogen atoms, take the equation that describes the existence of a P type electron, and now make a graph of that solution turns out that the solutions have the appearance of these bow ties or dumbbells that you see below. Again, when L is equal to one, there are three allowed M sub L values. So there are three unique P type orbitals. What we're showing you here is that these three unique P type orbitals orient themselves along an X, Y, or Z Cartesian direction in space so they are often called the 2px, 2py, 2pz if they're on energy level 2. If they're on energy level 3, they'd be the 3px, 3py, 3pz, and so forth. Now the nucleus would be sitting right at the origin of this coordinate system. So there's kind of like a dead spot in the middle. That's where the nucleus is. Then there are these lobes jutting outward from this in space representing the position of an electron with orbital angular momentum of one. Now remember, the idea again is you take the electron, smash it, it flies into an infinite number of chunks, and these chunks spray through space in this particular orientation. The electron is not a particle orbiting in a Rutherford, uh, or in a, something like Rutherford would think, is a satellite motion around the, the nucleus it's spread over the nucleus in this probability density as it is known and for the p orbital it takes this particular shape now if you were to designate higher energy level p orbitals remember p orbitals begin on two on level two because l can only be one when n is two so the first location of a p orbital is on energy level two but subsequently, there's a p orbital on energy level 3, 4, 
five, six, seven, and all others as well. So to think of what a, a 3P would look like, just make a bigger dumbbell further out in space because energy level three is further out in space. And then for the 4P, you'd put a shell or onion layer of a dumbbell further out in space. The 5P would be further out. The 6P would be even further out and so forth. Let's continue this theme. Let's now go to the L equal 2 orbital, known as a D. When L is equal to 2, M sub L starts again at minus 2 and goes up to plus 2 through integer values, meaning there are five allowed D orbitals on each energy level. Ds don't appear, however, until energy level 3 because L can only be 2 for an orbital where n minus 1 is equal to 2. So on level 3 is the first time L equal 2 is allowed. So 3D orbital is the first D orbital that can be uh, occupied by electrons. You have to get far enough out from the nucleus for electrons to possess this much angular momentum before they can start to occur. Okay. So now then, again, we can solve the equations of quantum mechanics for simple systems like hydrogen and get functions that describe a d orbital, make a plot of that function. Nobody has ever really seen a d orbital, but this is what those five solutions should appear like in, in a Cartesian framework. They're oriented along different parts of the x, y, and z coordinate realm and again the nucleus would be right at the origin of these so these are beginning to look like four leaf clovers notice essentially as you've up the amount of angular momentum you're upping the number of lobes that these orbitals can possess and again remember to keep in mind that the electron is kind of smashed into a infinite number of fragments and spreads through space in patterns that appear as you see in these designations below. Now again, the first appearance of this would be on energy level three, but every energy level subsequent to that would have an orbital of this type. So there could be a 4D, a 5D, a 6D, and so forth. And what you would do is simply just put orbitals of these particular shapes oriented further out in space, uh, like onion layers on top of these particular orbitals to indicate the higher energy level D type orbitals. Okay, moving on to the next possibility. Let's look at the L equal three orbital angular momentum quantum number or F orbital. Remember the F orbital can only begin to show up on atoms where electrons are populating energy level four because only when n minus one is equal to three can you have an l equal three type orbital so the first f that electrons occupy is a 4f orbital and when l is equal to three m sub l now begins down at negative three and goes up to plus three integer wise so there's a 2L plus 1 degeneracy. 2 times 3 plus 1 is 7L L equal 3 orbitals, or 7F orbitals appear at a time degenerately or equal in energy on any atom that has electrons occupying F orbitals. And as we've seen in the theme of the P and the Ds, what they ha have with this increasing angular momentum is an increase in the lobes of distribution of the electron density spread around the nucleus. So once again, the solution for the hydrogen atom, which we can solve exactly and get exact forms of orbitals that would be occupied for, by the electron on an H atom. If we look at the level energy level th four solution, with angular momentum three solutions, there are seven different values of M sub L, and you make a plot of those pictures of what the electron 
in that position would look like, and they would come out with plots you see of this increasing lobe structure where the nucleus is down near the center of those lobes. Again, remember this is a so-called probability density, meaning you smash the electron, spread it through space, and it will spread through space in patterns of one of these seven shapes. And if you went to a 5f orbital, they would have similar appearances. They would just be in space further out from energy level 4. Likewise, 6f would be further out and so forth. Now, we could con continue this idea and move now to the angular momentum L equal 4 orbital, known as a G. But it turns out that G orbitals are not necessary to populate, to get all electrons uh, com completed in the energy levels of all atoms that are known to, to us. So we won't go so far as to look at the appearance of a G orbital, because it's not really going to be relevant to the chemistry that is done with the atoms in the periodic table that we currently have. Okay, so we've described so far these three quantum numbers, n, l, and m sub l, but now we have to introduce the fourth of the so-called quantum numbers, and it turns out that it's a little bit weird, weirder than even the ones we've already talked about, which, okay, I agree, they are weird too, but this one is decidedly weirder. It is known as the phenomenon, it, is, it arises due to the phenomenon of what is known as electron spin. So let's try to paint a picture of what electron spin corresponds to first of all. Okay, if we now classically think of electrons as being in motion, you can see the orbital angular momentum comes about a, a, from its orbit or motion circularly around the nucleus. But now what we should also envision is the possibility that electrons can turn on their own axis. And if an electron turns on its own axis, it is spinning. And what we're going to claim then, if we think in a classical sense, is that not only is the electron orbiting the nucleus, it is also spinning as it orbits around the nucleus. The analogy to this would be the Earth. As it goes around the sun, it takes 365 and a quarter days to orbit the sun, but as it orbits the sun, it takes 24 hours to spin on its own axis. So as the Earth orbits, it spins. So now let's just uh, equ equate that to what's going on for an electron. Now, as the electron orbits, it also spins. So now, as if an electron is spinning, it is a charge in motion that is spinning. A charge in motion can create a magnet. And so the magnet of char caused by this charge in motion can have its north pole oriented in different directions, depending on which way the electron is spinning. So what has been determined is that electrons are either spinning in a clockwise fashion or a counterclockwise fashion as they orbit around the nucleus. If you're spinning in one direction, you have your magnetic north pole spinning so that the north pole is pointing downward. If you're spinning uh, in the opposite counterclockwise fashion, your magnetic north pole will point in the opposite direction and your north pole would point up so to designate this for electrons, physicists use the terminology that the electron is either spinning up or spinning down, depending on the orientation that its uh, north pole would make as this charge on a spinning motion will point its north axis either upward or downward, depending if the electron happens to be spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. So, this weird spin angular momentum is accompanied by a weird 
spin angular momentum quantum number. The symbol for this quantum number is m sub s. Now, again, the m has, says something about it. It's called a magnetic spin quantum number. So we have a, or a spin magnetic quantum number, as I've written it in the title there. So we have this spin angular quantum number, and we have this spin magnetic quantum number. And the reason, again, like the other one, that this is designated as a magnetic spin quantum number is that in order for scientists to prove the existence of this quantum number for electrons, magnets were employed to break a degeneracy or equal energy state which existed for the electrons being oriented as either spin up or spin down. It turns out that there's no um, um, favoritism for your orientation of spin. You can either be spin up or spin down, but um, in order then to differentiate the energy between them by putting magnets around electrons spinning up or spinning down, they will align with the field so that there are slight shifts in their energy under the course of making this alignment. So the, again, the use of magnets was important to determine that this was actually true. So this is then therefore called the spin magnet quantum number. Okay, it's symbolized M sub S. Remember the other one for the orbit was called M sub L. Now it turns out that since there are two orientations of spin that we call spin up and spin down, we can have a positive or a negative orientation of this quantum number. And these quantum numbers are to be separated integer wise so the only reason, the only way you can get from a negative number to a positive number separated by one unit is that one of these will be, and for the matter of fact, for the spin down case, the value of m sub s is minus one half. If you add one unit of spin angular momentum to that, minus one half plus one, you will get m sub s of plus one half, and that is when you have the spin oriented up. So once again, these are separated by single integer digits, just like all the other quantum numbers we've seen so far. But in order to get from a single integer dis difference uh, for these two allowed values, one of them has to be negative one half, that's the spin down case. One of them has to be positive one half, that is the spin up case. So this is the conclusion of our angular of our I'm sorry, our quantum number discussions at least in terms of what they are and their definitions. Now we're going to see several applications of how to employ the use of these to determine where location of electrons go in space. But please let me say one more time very clearly. You should know everything about the symbolic representation of these four quantum numbers. You should know everything about their allowed values, including where they're allowed to start where they are allowed to stop, what their limits are, in case they're governed by, say, how M sub L is allowed to go up to and down to plus or minus L, how L is allowed to go up to N minus one. These are all rules that you should know because somewhere on our next exam, I certainly will be asking you to prove to me that you know these things. So let's see now how we use these four quantum numbers to designate the location of an electron around the nucleus. What you should think of these four quantum numbers as representing are the coordinates in space, kind of like for each electron. So instead of talking about its location in space x, y, and z, you should think of thinking about the location of an electron in space according to its n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. They just replace coordinates in space with quantum numbers in space. Okay, so each of these four plays a role in where the electron is located, and each of these four plays a role in how many electrons on a given atom can simultaneously have or be in certain locations in space. Okay, so what I would like to point out to you then in many regards 
This is like going into a football stadium, as I've made the analogy with many times over. Instead of going into a certain gate and going to a certain section and finding a certain row, finding a certain seat, you need now to have a certain N value, then go to a certain L value, then go to a certain M sub L value, and go to a certain M sub S value, and now you can designate your location in the stadium, just like you can designate your location of an electron around an atom. Okay, so now the rules of quantum mechanics tell us that each electron possesses one of these spins, either spin up or spin down, with a quantum number m sub s equal plus one half, or m sub s equal minus one half, and that when an electron is of m sub s equal plus one half, it doesn't interfere with an electron of minus one half. In other words, they avoid each other entirely by having these opposite spins. What that means is electrons of opposite spin can pack their way into the same position in space due to the other three quantum numbers. So the orbital designation of L equal 1, 2, 3, or 4 tells you if it's an S of a P, D, F, or G orbital. And the designation of the M sub L tells you which of these S, P, D, F, or G orbitals you happen to be speaking of, in the case of them being degenerate. And now this orbital quantum number and angular quantum number uh, or a magnetic quantum number combined with this spin quantum number to allow you to tell how many electrons can be packed into a given type of orbital. So again, because of the weirdnesses of quantum mechanics, electrons spinning up and spinning down don't know anything about each other. They're like waves out of phase with one another. So they can simultaneously ride the same kind of ride. So two electrons can go into an s orbital, and there's only a single s orbital at a time. So there's a maximum of two electrons al allowed to ride the s ride on each energy level. Now then, beginning on energy level two, you're allowed to have p orbitals, because beginning on energy level two, you can begin to have l equal one orbitals, and then every orbital subsequent, or any, every energy level subsequent to two, has a p orbital as well. But because of m sub l, there's allowed to be three or p orbitals at a time. And now we're saying because of m sub s, you're allowed to pack two electrons into each of those p orbitals. So there are three p orbitals, pack two into each. That means you can ride six electrons in the p ride on every energy level that allows p rides. Next, let's go to the quantum number of the angular type L equal 2. When L equals 2, M sub L goes from minus 2 to plus 2. There are five M sub L values. There are five D type orbitals. And because they can now spin up or spin down in each of these five D type orbitals, you can pack a maximum of 10 electrons into the D ride. Now again, the Ds do not begin until energy level 3. Because it is on energy level 3, when L, L is allowed to be n minus 1 of 3 minus 1 of 2. So d orbitals begin on energy level 3 with the 3d. Subsequent to energy level 3, every other level has a d orbital. Then we'll talk about the f. Now f appears 7 at a time. Why? Because L is 3 for an f orbital. And m sub L ranges from minus 3 through 0 up to plus three, or has seven unique values. So there are a degeneracy of seven f orbitals at a time. And we saw pictures or indicating their lobes before. Now what we're claiming with this spin idea is you're allowed to pack a spin of each type, now not of the same type. You can't put two spin ups into each of these f's. You can't put two spin downs into each of these f types. You have to put a spin up and a spin down to each of these F's, there are seven of these F's, so that means you can pack a whopping 14 electrons into the F set of orbitals. Again, F does not begin to energy level four because it is on energy level four that you're first allowed to have L equal to three. So now with these basic rules,
we can begin to populate a many electron atom with electrons in space. So now what we're going to begin to do is to use the four quantum numbers that we've described along with some rules to populate electrons in a many electron atom. Okay, so we have our N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. And we see that most of these are integers. We have a few negative integers, and the M sub S has half integers. But we're going to use those four as coordinates, kind of like, to now place electrons around the nucleus. And in addition to those four quantum numbers, we will apply them using the so-called Aufbau Prinzip and we will use the Pauli exclusion principle, and we will use Hund's rule. So the next few slides will give some description of how to apply these three rules along with the four quantum numbers. So first of all, what is the Aufbau Prinzip? Prinzip is German for principle, uh, and Aufbau is German for buildup, so this is the build-up principle, and quite simply, what it says is if you want to make a multi-electron atom, you populate electrons according to the rules of quantum mechanics into their energy levels, but unless the atom is electric or energetically stimulated, the electrons preferentially go into the lowest energy slots. So you will order by order fill them into the lowest energy positions that they can occupy. Now, along with what we showed in our, with our staircase previously when we were describing the basic difference between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, I said when you're at the lowest energy position, you will be in the so-called ground state because you're at the bottom of the staircase. Well, that's what we will call the lowest energy electron configuration. That is the ground state configuration. When you don't energetically stimulate atoms with electricity, with chemical energy, and most importantly with light, then all the electrons remain in their lowest energy positions. Now, stimulating them with energy moves the electrons out of these low energy positions particularly with light. We can stimulate electrons from the low energy positions with light, and when the electrons want to cascade back to the low energy positions, they do so by shedding light. An electronic excited state has electrons populating the higher energy levels. Now, unless energy remains stimulating the electrons, they don't remain in excited states. As soon as uh, they have the chance, the electrons will go preferentially back to their low energy position that they prefer to exist in. Now let's, use, let's just briefly discuss our second rule that we're going to apply along with the quantum numbers to put electrons around atoms, and that is known as the Pauli exclusion principle. Now the Pauli exclusion principle is really quite simple. What it says is no two electrons can simultaneously possess the same four quantum numbers. Now here's what that's saying. I, I kind of mentioned what this means before. The quantum numbers are like coordinates for the electrons, where they go into the stadium to sit around the nucleus. No two people that watch a game in a stadium sit in exactly the same seat. Now they might go in the same section, the same row, the same uh, gate they might go in, but they have to sit in diff a different seat. Now, they could be in the same seat, but they'd have to be in different rows. So in some way, you have these four defining things, gate, section, row, seat, that tell you where to sit at the game. Now, electrons have N, L, M sub L, and M sub S to tell the electrons where to sit around the nucleus. And quite simply, no two electrons on the same atom can have these four same coordinates because they'll be in the exact same location at the exact same time. 
as long as they differ by one of these numbers and one only. Differing by one only allows them to not interfere with each other, be independent of each other, and buzz around the nucleus without any knowledge of each other. So the poly exclusion principle says that you uh, designate these quantum numbers for all electrons and that no two electrons can simultaneously have all or the same, but they can have three coinciding, just not that fourth being the same. The last of our rules that we're going to use to, along with the quantum numbers, to populate the electrons around the nucleus is known as Hund's rule. It was first described by Friedrich Hund. As you can see, in the 20th century, he made this claim. And it says that when you begin to put electrons around the atom, they follow the off-ball principle, they go into the lowest energy slots. They follow the Pauli principle that says they can't simultaneously have the same four quantum numbers. But still, when you're putting them into degenerate orbitals, or orbitals that have the same energy at the same time, they can go into them when we're, you're populating them, they first go into the ride separately. So there's three p orbitals, you put one into each p first. And also, Hund described the fact that they must spin in the same direction while they're in separate orbitals. When they're in the same orbital, they spin in the same direction. When they're in separate orbitals, they, sp I'm sorry, when they're in the same orbital, they spin in opposite directions, please excuse me. Same orbital, opposite directions. When they're in different orbitals of the same type, then they spin in the same direction. Now the next three or so slides will describe how to apply Hund's rule by beginning to populate electrons into atoms. Let's look at some of the representations that chemists use to designate the locations of electrons on atoms. First, let's talk about the so-called box notation. Often electrons are placed into boxes the boxes are labeled and designated as to where the electrons are going. So let's look at the box notation first for filling s orbitals. As it says there, remember, s orbitals are, are non-degenerate or singly degenerate. And because L equals zero, you can have an s orbital on all energy levels, beginning on energy level one up through infinity. They would all have an S energy level. There's zero units of angular momentum in the S orbital. And now, since there's only one of them, and they can each possess an electron spinning up or spinning down, there's a maximum of two electrons in each S on each energy level. So in the box notation, if the S electron you happen to possess is spinning up, you put a, an arrow pointing up in the box. If you have a single s electron spinning downward, you put an, point an electron with a downward pointing inside the box. Now, if this happens to be the energy level 1s, we would write 1s, and then for a single electron occupying it, we put a superscript on the right of 1. So I can have a 1s1 electron for a spin up or a spin down type electron. Now, statistically speaking, if you have a thousand atoms putting their electron into the 1s orbital and putting a single electron there, 500 of them will have the spin up type, 500 of them will have the spin down type, unless you trick them into going one way or the other by applying some magnetic field to force their hand. But uh, technically speaking, both of these are degenerate, equal in energy. You can't tell the difference in energy between them unless you begin to shine or, or subject them to a magnetic field. Then, then there will become differences in the orientation of this particular spin. Now on the right I show if you happen to have representing two s electrons, now it must be true that the only way that two s electrons can time simultaneously occupy the same s orbital, they must be spinning in opposite directions. 
Now, if you have 1 in the 1s and 1 in the 2s, they can spin in the same direction. But if they're both going into the 1s, the only way they can both ride the 1s ride is if they are spinning in opposite orientations. You can't have three electrons ride the 1s ride because there's no room. You can only have an electron of each spin, and there's a non-degeneracy, so there's no such thing as 1s3. But this would be indicated as 1s superscript 2. Some people say 1s squared. I don't really like to say that. I would call this 1s2. And the 2 indicates that you must have a spin orientation of each type, one spinning up and one spinning down, and we would place them in a box. Once again, the weirdness of quantum mechanics rears its ugly head when we go to look at the box notation for p orbitals. Okay, first of all, p orbitals are going to require three boxes, one for each of the three degenerate orbitals. They're, they're, they're all connected together because they're degenerate, or meaning they're exactly of the same amount of energy to occupy electrons into the boxes. Now I'm showing here what happens to be the 2p boxes. But remember, the p orbitals begin on level 2, but can exist on any level after 2. So there's also a 3p, a 4p, a 5p, a 6p, which would just be designated by changing the n in front of the p orbital designation. So when you put the first electron into the p rod, and the designation is 2p1, I'm showing in the picture I put it in the left box with an upward pointing arrow. That really did not need to happen. Nature doesn't care which of the boxes it goes in. It could have went into the 2p oriented on the x, the y, or the z, equally likely. And if you have, uh, have 3,000 electrons and you did this thing, you would find that 1,000 of them probably went into the x, 1,000 of them went into the y, 1,000 of them went into the z oriented p. So that is completely arbitrary which box you put the electron in. Also, it is, or it is arbitrary which orientation the electron takes in that box, meaning it could be a spin up electron that I put, or it could be a spin down electron that I put. So technically, there are six different ways to put the first electron in. It can go into any of the three boxes, and it can go into any of those three boxes up or down. I arbitrarily chose to do it where I did it. But now when we go to 2p2, meaning I need to populate two electrons into the p. Now there's a bunch of choices as to what goes on. Let's review what some of those choices could be. I want to put two electrons into three boxes. So since two of them can go into a box at a time, I have very many options again. I could put two electrons in the same box, both pointing in the same direction. I can put two electrons into the same box, pointing in opposite directions. I can put each one of each electrons into one box, each in a different direction. Or I can put one electron into each into one box, pointing in the same direction. So what we now have to turn to is what the experiment shows us that atoms prefer to do. And what we learn that atoms prefer to do when you have multiple degenerate orbitals that can possibly hold electrons. The electrons prefer to go into separate rides with spins oriented in the same direction. So we do not pack both the electrons into the same P with opposite spins. We certainly don't pack them into the same P with the same spins. That never happens. Never put them in the same ride in the same orientation. If they're going into the same ride, they have to go in opposite orientation. But it turns out nature tells us that what you do is you put them into a separate ride in the same direction. So my designation for 2p2 shows the left and middle boxes with an electron spinning up. Now they could have shown the left and right box with an electron spinning up. They could have shown the middle and right box with an electron spinning up. Or they could have shown those same pictures with both electrons spinning down. One thing is for sure, for two electrons, one goes into separate box than the other, and the orientation of the spin must be the same.
Now let me give you a clue as to how we know this is what goes on. These spins indicate the orientation of magnets. So certain atoms that would exist with this kind of orientation of their electrons, in particular carbon, we can tell by placing carbon atoms in magnetic fields that they have spin magnets that don't cancel. And so there's a reinforcement of these two north pointing magnets to make a stronger north magnet. And so a carbon atom on its own, because of these orientations of spin, can be attracted to an external magnet. Now it turns out that if the spins were opposite of one another, then the magnets would cancel and there would be no magnetic character to that atom. So because of placing atoms in magnetic fields, we know that they have these independent electrons that have orientations of their electrons preferred to be the same when you have two p electrons to occupy. Now likewise, when I go to three p electrons, there are three boxes possible. It turns out that they go into their own separated rods. This is exactly what nitrogen atoms do. and We can tell by the strength of the magnets that nitrogen atoms make with the presence of their unpaired spins, we call them. The spins orient themselves in the same direction and go into the three allowed separated boxes. Now they could all three be spin down, and that's equally likely to all three of them being spin up, but they, we don't have an up, down, up spin or a down, down, up spin. We find we have three up spins or three down spins, but all spins orient the same. So when we go to put the fourth electron into a p orbital, now, since there's only three boxes, now the electrons have to begin to pair. My, my suggestion to you is place three of them all first, oriented in the same direction, then come back and begin to pair with the fourth. Now, so any of the boxes can be the paired box. Again, I can put the two electrons paired into the middle box or the two electrons paired into the right box. I chose to do them in the left box on my 2P4 designation. Now the other two electrons could both be oriented down. They don't have to both be oriented up. They could equally likely both be oriented down, but I chose to do them upward. Now if you go to the designation 2P5, uh, I could also do 3P5. It would look just the same as this. Now you have to put five electrons into six locations. Two of the boxes have to show paired electrons. One of the boxes shows an unpaired electron. And again, it could technically be in either direction. Finally, when you put the sixth electron into the p-ride, there's no more room in the p-ride. All electrons uh, have to go in paired. And each of the boxes has two of the electrons from that pair in that particular orbital designation for the, for the three degenerate p's. The same idea would be true for occupying the 10 possible electrons that could ride the D-ride. Now I'm showing the 3D. This would be very similar for a 4D, 5D, 6D, so forth. For the D, you need to have five boxes. Why? Because the D orbitals are five-way degenerate, five equal energy locations, and all are equal in energy, so the first electron could be placed into any one of them. I happen to show it going into the leftmost box. It could have went into either, any of those other four boxes as well. And it could have went in there oriented in either direction, it completely independent. Now when I go to designation 3D2, I have to follow what I learn from study experimentally. And what I learn from study experimentally is that this gets pretty magnetic because the two electrons have their magnets pointing in the same direction. And in order for them to be able to pointing their spin magnets in the same direction, they must be in different boxes. Now, again, I could put them in any of the boxes that you see there that I want, as long as I put them in different boxes, both pointing in the same direction. 3D3, I continue this theme. I have a third electron going in. It can go in up or down, as long as all the other ones are up or down. They all must be in the same orientation. They must go into their own box. 
This continues with 3D4. I now have four unpaired magnet spins. 3D5, I have five unpaired magnet spins. This is getting to be a powerful magnet, as a matter of fact. Got so many electrons with their spins orienting in the same direction. Finally, when I get to populating a d orbital with its sixth electron, do I finally begin to come back and pair some spin? Not all the spins, but only one of the spins is paired. There's still a huge magnetic ability for a magnet of this type, for an atom of this type, because of the four unpaired spins all oriented in the same direction. Now again, those unpaired spins could all be up, but they all must be the same orientation of their magnet. When I go to 3D7, I will have two boxes with two electrons each, three boxes with one electron each, all those unpaired electrons in the same orientation. Then continue this for eight. I will have two unpaired spins of the same orientation, 3D9, one unpaired spin. And finally, when I get to the 10th electron, all electrons are paired, all orbitals are occupied to their max. Let me now mention one of the dark, dirty secrets of quantum mechanics. The equation that we solve when we're discovering this information about the location of electrons around the nucleus is known as the Schrodinger equation. That might be a name that you could have heard somewhere along the way. It's one of the most celebrated equations of physics. A very detailed mathematical equation requires a lot of calculus to be able to uh, understand and interpret. We're not going to worry about even looking at it here. I just want to point out to you that it turns out that only the hydrogen atom itself can be solved exactly with the Schrodinger equation. Remember, the hydrogen atom is the first element in the periodic table. The hydrogen atom in a neutral form has a single electron. So only the neutral hydrogen atom, it turns out, can be solved. As a matter of fact, H negative 1 can't be solved. As soon as you add an extra electron on to hydrogen, the mathematics becomes so complicated you can't solve the differential equations of the calculus for that particular system. So only hydrogen can be exactly solved. Now, believe me, we can use numeric tricks and computers to really get very close to the accurate solution for hydrogen, or I'm sorry, for hydrogen minus one, for helium, for lithium, and beryllium, and on and on it goes. But we can't analytically solving it. And what it means to analytically solve it means you get an equation out. And then that equation can be plotted and graphed and looked at and, and thought about. So we only know the appearance of the orbitals for hydrogen actually. But we apply the appearance of orbitals that we've got for hydrogen to understanding what goes on in carbon, to understanding what goes on in iron, to understanding what goes on in gold. So even though it's not exactly correct to use the solutions from hydrogen to interpret the behavior of carbon or oxygen, we're still going to do so. And it turns out it works fairly well. So um, the orbitals that we're talking about, the pictures we've seen, are only really the pictures that result for the hydrogen atom. Now it's going to, therefore, um, because of the differences for a many electron atom, we're going to have to play a, a little bit of tricks with the solutions that the hydrogen atom says we should have because of the existence of more than one electron present. So we're going to have to slightly modify our hydrogen answers if we want to apply the answers to say a carbon atom. So very often these pictures that we've seen for a 1s, a 2s, a 3s, and so forth, a 2p, a 3p, a 4p, and so forth, we call them hydrogenics because they were actually derived from the hydrogen atom itself. 